<laughs> All right, good morning. This is a recording made in Newark, Delaware. Uh, Mr. Gilbert and perhaps some others will be listening to this at a later date. They'll have the privilege of hearing me yell at them only through the PC computer. You guys get to have the acoustic real thing, and I'm sure you know which one you would prefer. So good morning, folks. And uh, thank you for getting your homeworks in. I think you're doing pretty well on those, catching up on the chivalry and Bushido uh, exercise that I assigned a little earlier. Next week is the PBL. I want to have enough time to talk about all of this. And this is the week that I, as I think some of you know, have been building up to for quite a while. So there's a lot to cover. Hang on, put your, put your hands down below and just grip your chair and just hang on because I got a lot of ground to cover and we want to make sure that I give you some background on the PBL next week. So medieval Europe, what's the, uh, what's the end of this phrase? You can't make an omelet, what? You can't make an omelet without bacon. Without bacon. It's <laughs> true. Without aliens. I mean, no, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. That's the old saying that old folks like me say. And that's the image I want to hold out to you uh, today as we look at. What as if we you find the eggs already broken. If you find what that the egg know? is already broken. <laughs> yeah, well, some people, if it's being cooked, I think you're all right. Anyway, so. In this high Middle Ages period, from about 1,000 or 1,100 on through the 15th century, this is where Europe does what we've been talking about, building up to all this time. It stages this enormous comeback, this worst to first growth of its power, its wealth, and its technology against all the other cultures, really, of the world, even Africa is in some ways more advanced and certainly a lot wealthier than Western Europe, starting around 1000. The New World, we're still finding out stuff about what's going on over there, but they had some terrific advancements as well. And when you look at the race between cultures over the course of ancient and medieval history, two things. First of all, Europe has been very much uh, unlucky in this horse race, right? The gates open up and China and India and Near East all come out and there's nothing, nothing coming out of the gate from Western Europe. And then Suddenly, Greece, Rome, out comes this lightning fast horse that by around the second turn is catching up to the rest of the world, it's making up all this enormous crowd. And then around 500 AD, the Western European horse, I mean, throws a shoe, falls down, throws its rider off into the sidewall as the other cultures go racing on at about the same speed. And it looks like it's all over. Anybody who had a Western European horse racing ticket is tearing it up and throwing their hands in the air. But then, a few hundred years later, Europe is getting back on its horse and starting to catch up amazingly fast. Now we're about the third turn. It's like, incredible, here comes Western Europe on the outside rail, and it's passing Africa and Latin America like they were standing still. And, and they're going to eventually become, as I said, the wealthiest and most powerful culture in the world. And the, what's driving that are a bunch of factors that were all born inside this medieval culture, which all the world cultures are in at this point, ancient medieval cultures, which have certain very strong characteristics. And Western Europe takes advantage of the kind of protective shell, if you will, of this medieval culture to recover and grow and catch up, even to the other world's more wealthy and at the time more advanced cultures. But in so doing, they broke that shell and were the first culture to really shatter this old medieval way of looking at things, ancient and medieval way of looking at things, and to start this new attitude toward the world that really caught the rest of the planet flat-footed. And then it kicks off a period, if you come for modern world history next year, you'll see there's a period, 1500 to 1900 and beyond, in which Western Europe utterly dominates the globe completely in charge, colonies, imperialism, a lot of things that'll make you scratch your head, but it, it is by far and away the most powerful culture in the history of the world. And it comes out of this medieval culture, but it breaks that culture, just like you have to, if you're gonna make an omelet. So what is medieval Europe anyway? It's the same as other medieval ancient cultures worldwide, ranked, routine, religious. Routine meaning, they follow customs very, very powerfully. If your dad was a, a thatcher, a guy who fixed roofs, you were gonna learn how to fix roofs. 
If he was a peasant farming a land, that's what you were going to do. You're going to marry someone who's from that level of society. You were going to follow the same customs that your parents did. And even the nobility, even the highest and most powerful, were going to continue to do as their families had done for, in some cases, centuries. And it was ranked, right? Everything is strictly categorized. There are levels within levels, no matter where you go in this society, right? The feudal system has vassals and overlords who have sworn their oaths. And sometimes a guy could be the baron, for example. He's an overlord to several knights, but he's also a vassal to a duke and the duke the same way to a king. We even have kings who are vassals to each other, which is really weird, right? But it's all orderly. This exchange of oaths is based on different ranks. The knighthood, you saw, they go through they go through various stages of training, the page, the squire to the knight. The religious orders are also strictly very hierarchical. At the kind of bottom level are the priests and the friars, the wandering uh, priests, monks and nuns living in their holy orders removed from the world, and then, and then a hierarchy above them of the abbot or the abbess or the monastery or convent, and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and the pope or patriarchs. Um, to, to establish this kind of ranking system. Most importantly, I think the guilds in Western Europe, that's where all this commercial wealth really starts to come from. And there again, there is this system. You are an apprentice, you learn the tricks of the trade, the journeyman, you start to show you can do the work on your own, by your own, and then you become a master, you start to run a shop for yourself, whether it's pottery or dyeing cloth, or a silversmith, you learn the art, you, you learn the craft, and you keep the secrets, and you keep them in-house. These guilds, these merchant guilds begin to pile up a lot of money, and trade becomes easier and easier and more and more profitable as time goes by. They start to build up more money than the knights and the bishops have. That's one of the things that really puts a lot of pressure on this system. And down at the bottom, there really isn't a lot of movement. You, you could be a serf or a villain with an E, with an E, right, means you're you're just a regular peasant farmer, not an A. You're not a bad person, but you're at the bottom of society, farming the land. You owe part of your crops produce to the local knight. You had to pay your tithing to the church. You could be someone who has one of these local crafts, a carpenter, a barrel maker, something like that. Some of you will have a choice of being a certain kind of crafter next week. And then there are merchants who sort of feed back into the guild system. They, they bring goods from place to place over land or overseas, and they can compile large amounts of money, but they're never really part of the nobility. They are still part of the common order. So it's ranked everywhere you go. And this culture, perhaps more than any other, certainly more than China, or India or Japan, Western European culture is really infused with religious sentiment everywhere. The church and this, this Christian religion drives everything. You've got the feudal system back at the top. They're swearing oaths that are very practical. I'm gonna let you use this land. You're gonna bring so many guys to help defend me in war. But then in comes all this chivalric thinking, right? That you're gonna to swear to be a good knight. You're gonna protect the weak and helpless. You're gonna honor the church. And so even there you see this religious sentiment penetrates and it really penetrates through all of society. Everyone is, is deeply beholden to this church. And in this system, Western Europe grows tremendously over the period. Remember back when Rome fell, the population of the, of the Roman Empire, this European area, fell to about 12 million. Look what happens. By 1,000, 400 years later, the population has grown up to about 56, 57 million people. By 1100 AD, over 60 million, 1200, 1250, 1300, up, up, up. Whoops, what happened here? This tremendous loss of population. What happened here? Yes, next week happened here, okay? This is what happened. Suddenly about a 20, 30, maybe in, in some estimates as many as 40% of, of the medieval European population is killed. And that's all because of the plague. But then look, see, tremendous recovery back. And by the time Columbus discovers America, we have a population of 90 million people living in Europe. And not just population, but also wealth. Again, largely because of this guild system, look what happens. The growth in the aggregate product of Europe, which is an estimate. This is just an estimate. By 1000 AD, about 10.9 million uh, being produced by all of what we would call Western Europe. 
quadruples, quadruples by 1500. And they haven't even discovered the new world yet. Right? So tremendous growth in wealth over this course of this period. Nobody, even the conquerors, haven't gained wealth like this over that period of time. All right, the Crusades. We start talking like the like the Federal Express guy, the early quick, the guy, the, the lawyer at the end of the commercials. Okay, here's what happened. I'm gonna have to go really fast through the Crusades. Here are the slides. I urge you to look more at it. It's a fantastic period in history. We did a little bit of this already. The Byzantine Empire suffers a crushing blow when the Seljuk Turks come in in 1071 and destroy a whole Byzantine army. All of this orange territory falls under Seljuk Turk control. Byzantine Empire reduced to what is looks like today modern Greece and a few islands. The Byzantine Emperor appeals to Western nobles for help. He says, come on, save the church. It's still our church, right? Uh, sort of. There's, 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 this, that schism has already happened. But the Pope picks up the call, Pope Urban II, and he calls for a crusade. He says, I need all the nobles in Europe to go and recapture the Holy Land from the infidel. Because the Turks, even though the, the Arab Muslims had held this Holy Land, Jerusalem and the, and the cities around it for hundreds of years, they allowed people to come and visit. They were kind of relaxed. But the Seljuk Turks are all still on fire with their new religion. And they've closed the Holy Land to visitors, to pilgrims. So now the Pope says, go and fight to reconquer the Holy Land and I'll forgive the sins of any knight who goes. You know, absolution of all sins. And they come from all over. Just a huge bag of, of different knights and retainers and dissatisfied noblemen who just want something more in their life. They all start milling their way down. See all the various lines of 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 migration. They're French, they're German, some of them are English, they're Italian. They argue with each other. They got no idea what they're doing. They haven't brought enough supplies. They should have lost. They should have been completely destroyed. And at the heart of the First Crusade, they're all bottled up in the city of Antioch up here. They're being besieged by vastly superior Muslim forces, and they're starving. They're eating leather and grass. They're days away from totally collapsing. And then... They discover the holy lance, the, the, the weapon which the Roman soldier used to pierce Jesus' side at the crucifixion. They called it a lance, right? The Romans, I'm telling you, did not call it a lance. They called it a spear, but this is, this is the 11th century. We've rediscovered the holy lance. I have nothing to say about the prospect of something made of wood surviving for 12 centuries. Can it? Yes. Is it likely? You know what it is? It's a miracle. That's what it is. This army, besieged and starving, rediscovers the holy lands in Antioch. They break out of the fortress. They defeat the larger army. They go storming down the coast and take Jerusalem. And then they enact a massacre of the non-Christian inhabitants of the city. That's something that conquerors do. You've seen that before, right? Hey, you Jews, you Muslims, you're the wrong religion. And they killed something like 80 or 100,000 people. That's horrible whenever anybody does it. But this is religious fervor, and we've seen that before too. Out of nowhere, they reconquer the holy city, and they establish what we call outremer, these kingdoms that are now governed by Western lords, Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli, and of course the kingdom of Jerusalem. They take all that away from the Muslims in one lightning stroke. And I mean, if God doesn't will it, who did? Human effort didn't get this done. They were incredibly disorganized, arguing with each other. Nobody made any preparations, and yet they won. But of course, the Muslims are there all the time. They fight back. They eat away at these kingdoms. They start to take more and more land away. And at the Battle of Hattin, I tried to put it on the map and then it just, it just didn't stick. Right about here, between Jerusalem and Acre, the Battle of Hattin took place. A crusader army completely destroyed by this new leader out of Egypt, Saladin. He destroys a crusader army there, takes over the kingdom of Jerusalem, takes back most of the kingdom of Jerusalem in a single stroke. That inspires the Second Crusade, which is the opposite of the First Crusade in every way. It's completely well organized. It's led by two very, very powerful nobles. It, it supplies itself along the way. They don't argue. They're completely coordinated, and it fails. 
they can't get through. They can't get through to Jerusalem. A lot has to do with how well the Muslims are organized. During the First Crusade, these Seljuk Turks were kind of arguing with each other. And it's sort of like capture the flag. The, the First Crusaders just kind of ran right by them while they were quibbling. And they went, what, what, that was your job. And then they, they lost Jerusalem. But now they're united under Saladin. And he destroys the Second Crusade, 50 or 40,000 soldiers without trouble, inspiring the Third Crusade. Richard I, the Lionhearted, he's another great leader. He argued with his fellow leaders. One of them went home. They weren't terribly well organized, but he fought Saladin to a standstill and they came to an agreement, a kind of truce. Saladin would retain control of Jerusalem, but he would start to allow unarmed Christians to come to Jerusalem on holy visits. And some of these other crusader kingdoms remained in Western control for a couple of hundred, 300 years after that. So the Crusades were the attempt of the Western kingdoms to recapture the Holy Land from the Muslims in the period between the late 1100s and certainly into the 1300s. They were, they were probably over by then. After the Third Crusade, you really never see one that succeeds again. The Fourth Crusade gets totally derailed. It never ends up even going to the Holy Land. They hang around outside of Byzantium, Constantinople, for a few weeks, and then they eventually just take and sack Constantinople. There's this, there's this thinking that really, you know, the Byzantines aren't really Christians either. So we're just gonna we're just gonna get our money here. And they never end up going to the Holy Land at all. The one place where the Crusades are successful is over here in Spain where the Iberian lords are slowly taking back the lands that the Moors conquered way back when, before the Battle of Tours, six and 700 years earlier. The legend of El Cid, he's sort of the, the King Arthur of, um, of Spanish lore, great, um, great legends told of him and, and a, a, a really powerful war leader. They're pushing back the Muslims in what's called the Reconquista, they make steady progress, and in 1492, the same year that Columbus sails the ocean blue, uh, the Spanish retake the city of Granada, which is down here. The last little outpost of Muslim control is turned back over to Christian uh, control under the king of uh, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella of Aragon and Castile. So Spain becomes a united Western European kingdom over this period. They do make some progress in Spain, but not the Holy Land. The Middle Ages were a period of legends, myths. We can't really prove a lot of the things, the stories that were told. And one of them is the absolutely horrifying tale of the Children's Crusade, which you read about briefly in the textbook. It would appear spontaneously that both in France and in Germany, enormous crowds of quote unquote children rose up and decided to go to the Holy Land. Again, driven by their fervor, by their religious piety, these young children just started walking south across France, south across Germany and over the Alps, thinking that when they got to the port, Marseille or Genoa, they, they would either get transported to the Holy Land by friendly merchants or the seas would just part like they did for Moses and they would walk to Israel. That, this, is, this shows you, you know, the importance of geography class, right? These kids don't have had geography class. They don't understand anything about how far it is. The privation was incredible. Thousands of them died getting there. The ones who came down from Germany met the Pope, and he said, kids, your hearts are in the right place, but go back and get a little older and then come back as adults. And he sent them back home. And they went back over the Alps, barefoot, wintertime, snow. 12,000 may have set out from Germany, maybe 2,000 got home alive. In, in France, they marched all the way south across the center of France. People would give food to them, you know, stunned. Here comes all these kids, this, you know, this crowd of kids. They would like try to feed them and help them and they would keep on going. They got to Marseille and the merchant said, sure, right this way. They put them on boats, sailed them to Egypt and sold them into slavery. So things are obviously changing, right? Not everybody is feeling that crusade fervor. Were they all children? We don't know. The people who write about this are church leaders. You know, you sometimes use the word children in a paternal way, right? My flock, my children, right? So it might not have been all children, but the two leaders, this fellow Stephen and possibly Nicholas, were kids. 
And they seem to have had an authentic religious inspiration or vision, which caused this massive movement of children across Central Europe. Horrifying, awful. We can't prove a lot of the details, but these are the stories that come down. This is what crusading ended up meaning and affecting in this period. And finally, I want to talk about the, the Hospitallers and the Templars. These religious orders across Europe were very powerful. The monasteries, the abbeys, they were refuges. They were centers of learning. They were uh, hospitals for the poor. Very important. But there were a few who decided to be, they wanted to become military monks. They appealed to the Pope, you know, give us an order like the Benedictines have, like the Franciscans have. We'll swear oaths of loyalty and, and chastity and poverty and obedience, just like they do. But let us go and fight to protect the Holy Land, the places that have been taken. And the Pope gave permission for them to have certain fortresses on the island of Cyprus and Rhodes and, and certain places in the Holy Land like Acre. And they ended up uh, protecting the pilgrims who were trying to go to the Holy Land, fighting against the Muslims when they had to. Very, very highly respected, very, very powerful, well-trained knights who were in, under holy orders. And they, they never got any wealth individually, but the order piled up all kinds of money, right? All kinds of wealth in land, in gold, in plunder, in tribute payments, just like lots of nobles did in other places. In 1291, the last Christian fortress in, in the Holy Land falls. It's the city of Acre down by the coast. The Muslims have been besieging it. The Templars are defending it. The Muslims explode a great uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, satchel charge outside the stone walls, blow this huge gap in the walls, and the Muslims, thousands and thousands of them, are preparing to charge in as soon as the smoke clears. And when the smoke does clear, they see standing in that gap, 11 Templar Knights, just ready, you know, okay, let's do this. And something like five or 6,000 Muslim soldiers looked at it. They'd been blowing their horns and their trumpets and their drums and everything. And they just looked at those knights standing there and they said, yeah, you know what? Not today. And they, they backed off for one more day because the Templars were just that good and that doughty, as they say that puissant. The next day they stormed the, the, the castle and, and no one survived. But for that one day, the Templars just said, let's do this. And the Muslims said, yeah, maybe not today. You go first. No, you go first. So, so they were a remarkable influence and a remarkable uh, story of their own. But again, now that the Holy Land has fallen, some kings, like the king of France, are saying, well, why do they have all this money? What are they doing? They have, they still have all these castles and tithings and so forth back in Europe that they've been using to fund their defense of the Holy Land. Well, what are you, what are you doing with all that money? And the king of France moves in on the Templar order. He accuses them of witchcraft. He has them all imprisoned and tortured and executed, and he seizes all of their wealth. So again, this medieval order is starting to crack, right? How did the shell break as a result of the Crusades? As you know, capturing Jerusalem exalted the knightly order tremendously. Well, losing it really hurt. People all over Europe thought, oh, wait, we thought God was on our side. How could we lose Jerusalem? And then fail to get it back time and time again. So it kind of cracked the confidence and the religious beliefs of Europeans. And then again, many knights were simply killed. And many that were not killed were completely destroyed financially. They had to sell and mortgage everything to finance their crusade, and it didn't work out. So even if they weren't killed, they were kind of stuck. They had to stay in the Holy Land or take service with some other lord and, and become just a, just a man at arms, just a retainer. They lose their lands back home. And as a result of that, the middle part of the feudal system, the glue that holds it together, is now weakened. The kings become more powerful. They start to exert more and more control because there's fewer knights. And by the same token, the peasants start to start to gain more freedom. You can't really keep them down on the farm when your manor has been abandoned, right? So things are starting to crack and loosen as a result of the strains that the Crusades put on the feudal system particularly. Briefly, the church, as you know, huge, powerful influence in all aspects of medieval life in Western Europe. These cathedrals would take more than a man's lifetime to build. If you were a stonemason or a stained glass maker or an ironsmith, 
you would be working on this cathedral all of your life and your father had worked all of his, the cathedral all of his life and it might take part of your son's life to finish. These things 60, 70, 80 years to complete. Huge soaring spaces inside. They were built to be as close as possible to a direct imitation of the heavenly city. They were trying to show what heaven would look like. These gorgeous statues and, and, and stained glass. This is the one church back then, what we call the Roman Catholic Church today, building these cathedrals. And again, this whole hierarchy, you know, gathers tithing, gets a lot of money. And this is the purpose that they put it to, these enormously impressive cathedrals. Plus, the church was running the hospitals, the monasteries for the religious orders. They had a, a complete monopoly on any kind of learning. There were really no universities yet. They're going to come about in this period. But if you went to school, you were probably going to a church school, which meant that you were learning Latin, not the language that everybody was speaking, French, German, English. You were learning Latin, and the only thing you were really reading were holy books, holy works, things that the, the, the doctors of the church had written, and of course the Bible in Latin. So that begins to break in this period as well. The fall of Acre, of course, was a, a real mental step for a lot of people in Western Europe. They knew the Holy Land was lost. They knew that whole crusading idea was not going to happen again. There was some talk of later crusades. I think there were eight altogether, but they never even tried to go back to the Holy Land. They weren't even aiming at the Holy Land after uh, after the fall of Acre. And so the church seems to have taken a blow there. You know, are you really speaking for God? Do you really know what God wants? That's what Pope Urban said back in 1191. He put out his call for crusade. He said, Deus vult, God wills it. You know, I know I'm hearing it from him. And in the first crusade, it seemed to work. But now it doesn't seem like he's uh, listening so much. The Templars, again, a big shock. People hearing that they were actually practicing witchcraft, and, and no, they weren't, but, but to confiscate all of their property and destroy that order. This is really big. All this time in the Middle Ages, the church has been focusing only on the holy works, the writings in the Bible, the writings of approved church doctors, guys like Eusebius and Augustine and others. They've completely ignored the existence of classical knowledge, and for the most part, they've let it, they've let it rot and be destroyed. The works of the Greeks and the Romans, the science, the math, the philosophy, the drama, all of those things that were written down were really preserved by their enemies, the Muslims, who were happy to translate them into Arabic and study them. They didn't, they weren't afraid of science. They didn't think it was unholy to look at, at math or, or chemistry or, or physics. They looked at those things. The thing is, the Muslims didn't value them very highly. Science was fine, uh, uh, scholarship was fine, but really in their hierarchy, the top two things to Muslims were, of course, religion, the imams, the writings of the holy men, and then second to that would be poetry. That was the thing they really thought was a high art, and where it was like right next to religiosity, it would be to write a verse about your, your faith, right? Would be That would be the highest form of art. And all the rest of literature and all the rest of science, it's fine, but they didn't really study it to advance. They didn't really try to work on advancing things. Well, now, Western Europe suddenly starts to rediscover all this classical knowledge, the writings of people like Aristotle and Ptolemy and Archimedes, the science, the, the dramatics, um, the philosophy. And, God, and church fathers like Thomas Aquinas come along, and Aquinas says, you know what? Reason comes from God. It can't be evil. Right? There must be a way that everything Aristotle said squares with what we've been taught as Christians. And so he wrote the Summa Theologica in which he built this bridge between everything the church teaches and everything the Romans and the Greeks discovered. He's a pretty smart guy, as you might imagine, pretty formidable intellect, right? He put all this together. And now the universities spring up, which are not being run by the church, and they're studying all of these different arts and sciences that the church had really ignored for six or 700 years. And unlike the Muslims, unlike the Chinese, unlike the Indians, the Western Europeans are gonna make something of this knowledge. They're gonna start building on it, their classical, their classical training. This is what brings about the Renaissance, of course, one of the things that leads to it. The church is also just plain making mistakes and running into error. Simony is what, I think you had to define that, right? 
What is simony? Doesn't mean si that Simon says what? Selling church position. Yeah. How are you supposed to give a church position away? How are you supposed to appoint another bishop or cardinal? You're supposed to do it by you know the merit of the fellow, right? He's he's good. He's holy. He's he's done his work. No. Now they're just selling it. They're just selling the office to this duke's third son or whatever. Well, yes, he drinks. It's all right. I mean, he's not really very religious, but you're paying me money. So that's an obvious abuse that people can point to. Even peasants can point to that and go, well, come on. That's ridiculous. Right? So it's an obvious abuse that brings the church in for a lot of criticism. That's from the bottom up. Now, from the top down, it really destroys the reputation of the church when they start to have more than one pope. I think I've told you already. Like, let me let me just repeat. I'm Roman Catholic, right? Roman Catholics believe that the Pope is the spiritual leader of the whole church and that there are occasions, it's called ex cathedra, under specific circumstances, the Pope can issue a decree and it's considered to be infallible. In the Middle Ages, they believed that. It becomes a lot harder to believe that the Pope is speaking infallibly when there are three of them. The French king gets into an argument with the Italian pope, and he just puts the bag on him. He just kidnaps him and drags him off to Avignon in southern France and says, now you want to do this, don't you? Don't you? And then he starts to appoint the popes himself instead of the College of Cardinals. Well, the people back in Italy don't like that, so they appoint another pope. And they don't like that pope. He's like, he starts doing things they don't like, so they sort of throw him over and elect another one. And they all claim to be pope at the same time, and they all excommunicate each other. And the rest of Europe is like, excuse me, what? We're, we haven't invented soap operas yet. What's going on? So the church is taking a big hit in terms of its reputation, in terms of uh, its influence and believability. And that's cracking the ship once again. And it's going to lead to the rise of what, what we call Protestant movements. Most people mark the beginning of the Reformation with with Martin Luther, who nailed his 95 theses to the wall in the 1500s. But before that, there were what they called peasant rebellions, Wycliffe and Huss. And those rebellions, what people are now starting to see, those rebellions were primarily driven by religious factors. They might seem to you like really silly religious factors. Wycliffe is saying, you know what? We should, we should be able to read the Bible in English. Kill him. You can't have that. Kill him. Remember, the Muslims don't think the Quran is the Quran unless it's in Arabic, right? That's not a rare idea that it needs to stay in the language, the original language. But people, spoiler alert, Jesus, Jesus didn't really speak Latin. He spoke Greek and Aramaic and, and Hebrew. He was trilingual, but he didn't speak Latin. He, he, he was, that's not the original language in which the, the, the New Testament should be written down. So the whole thing's getting a little tangled. And then Jan Hus and his followers in, in Central Europe, in, in the area where we now have Czechoslovakia and Bohemia and Poland, he said, uh, it's, it's uh, wrong for the church to only let us have the bread at communion, and then he gets to have the wine as well as the bread. We should all have the bread and the wine. And again, no, you've got to die. You've got to die. That's a heresy, right? So these are, these are religious protests about how the practice of the church should be and uh, they are very early Protestant movements in the 12 and 1300s. Ugh. Look at the maps. Can you think I could possibly explain this to you? Are you kidding me? England and France start to actually form in the late Middle Ages. Nobody's really talking about the English versus the French in this early period. And why not? In way back in 1066, the guy who lived here, William the Conqueror, who owned Normandy, he was Duke of Normandy, he was vassal of the King of France. He went over and conquered England and became the King of England, right? But he was still the vassal of the King of France because he was Duke of Normandy. Okay, fine. Henry II marries Eleanor of Aquitaine, and this orange land plus England is all his. He owns more of France than the French king does. Nobody's speaking about France, the kingdom, in 1190. It looks like it's going to be united under one king, and his name is Henry II. Then John, remember Robin Hood, right? King John, Prince John, he's evil. He's also incredibly incompetent. He lost 
all of this land to the French. He only has this part left, the Gascon part and a little port called Calais over here. He loses all his land in France, which is why he has to put the taxes so high, which is why Robin Hood was robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. He probably existed. There were, there were bandits like that, right? It's because King John Lackland, John Lackland, the only king of England ever to be named John. They didn't go back to John after this guy. He was a terrible war leader. They called him John Soft Sword, which is, that is way out of bounds. That is really not a nice nickname to have. He lost it all. And then over time, the Edwards start to get it back. And again, we're looking at the, this, this, uh, this, this is the Orange Territory belonging to England here when the, the Hundred Years' War breaks out. And then look at how much it grows over time under Edward III and Edward IV. And then this. And then finally, because of the influence of people like Joan of Arc, what we now, it looks a lot like France begins to form, right? And as the English get thrown off of the French continent under John and then later under Joan of Arc fighting for France, they begin to pay more and more attention to England, speaking English, attending to English laws. You know, hey, this is our home now. They were French ancestry, but hey, this is all we got left. Nationalism, okay? That's the word we're looking for. They start to value their nation, the forming nations of France and Europe, and that's going to spread later to Spain and then much later to Germany and Italy. They're going to start to form nations in Western Europe, and Christendom is, is fading, right? The idea that we're all Christians together, that's really starting to, to fade. I can't believe I just did three minutes on the Hundred Years' War. That's insane. That's wrong. That's a crime. Please come back five more days in a row so I can talk about this stuff. Please. So the feudal system, back breaking the shell, right? That's all we got to focus on here, <clears throat> is weakening under the growth of Europe in this period. The rising power of kings, which I already spoke about, <clears throat> they're hiring larger armies. They're getting more power against their um, their feudal vassals. The dukes and the earls aren't exerting as much power as they used to. They're starting to think in terms of our nation, first and foremost. I'm English. I'm French. This is my country. I'm going to govern it. Joan of Arc, of course, her career, again, just this extraordinary, legendary lightning bolt across the world, right? This peasant girl says, yep, yeah, the angels are talking to me. Don't give him the country. The Dauphin, the, the prince of, of the previous French king, is all set to give up the, the throne of France to the British invaders. She says, no, don't do that. I'm going to lead your armies. We're going to beat them. And they get the Dauphin says, no, please. But you know, you can't explain everything away just with skepticism. He summons her to court, the Dauphin. She's never met him. She summons her to court. And then he says, you, come over here. We're in the crowd. Sit here on the throne. He goes over and stands in the side behind the crowd. She comes into the throne room in front of this guy who's just sitting there. She looks at him for about two seconds, and then she turns and says, my lord. She just points him out. She knows which one he is. Can't explain that. And when she leads an army in armor against the superior-sized British army to raise the siege of Orleans, and does, I'm forced to consider the possibility that something is happening here which is beyond my ken. Miraculous. Certainly very influential in the history of the world. Because of Joan of Arc's campaign, the French get French territory back under their control. They really begin to eject the British from the continent. And, and Joan is horribly betrayed and captured and turned over to the British and tortured and executed. She's burned as a witch. She gives her life for the king of France, who showed her no gratitude whatsoever. If I could go back in time, I would kick his butt for a week. What an awful person he was, turning her over, letting her go from the Burgundians to the English. What a coward. But she gave him his country back. And the French begin to establish themselves. New weapons are throwing the knight off the battlefield anyway, right? The longbow at Crecy, right? This is a very powerful weapon. It's a new weapon. I want to talk about it. I can't. It's really powerful. And in the right circumstances, the knights are actually helpless against it. The logger. See, this, this is like a, like a, like a, 
Western wagon trains circling against the Indians. That's what the Hussites did when they were rebelling against the Knights in Central Europe. Oh, this is just the most incredible campaign in history. They had these armored wagons. And when, the, when they saw the Knights of Germany and Bohemia coming to crush them, they circled the wagons. They literally circled the wagons. And the, the general, uh, Ziska, inside, he, he trained these guys to use big, long halberds and flails and muskets inside the wagons, little ports and poof, you know, right through the wagons. And what are the knights going to do? They charge up to the wagons and then what? <laughs> what are you going to do? You charge up to the wagons and you over and over and over again. Because all they know how to do is charge. Here's the king of, of the Prince John of Bohemia at Crecy. He's blind. The French knights charged into the longbows so arrogantly, and they fell by the hundreds. Prince John was blind. He had them strap him onto his horse, and he led the charge. He died, of course. What is going on, right? This, what's going on is the old way of doing things is passing from the world, right? We're learning about different ways to fight. Better ways to fight. The power of commerce. The peasants, however, still not much freedom. You guys debated in your answers whether serfs were slaves or not. And I'm willing to entertain both answers. They really couldn't move. They couldn't leave their farms. Yeah, they couldn't be sold. But it's really not a, not a big difference between a serf and a slave. Well, that's going to change, right, with the bubonic plague. Two things I want you to, to focus on when we think about plague diseases, epidemic diseases. Morbidity is the question of how likely you are to become infected if you are exposed to this germ. We know they're germs now. Morbidity, how likely are you to get the disease? The common cold is extremely morbid. You're going to get it if you're exposed to somebody who sneezes on you. You're just going to get a cold. It's very, very morbid. But a cold is not very mortal. How likely, if you do get it, are you to die? Right? The, co the cold is not very mortal. Smallpox is very mortal. Cholera and the bubonic plague. What makes them deadly is that they combine high morbidity with high mortality. COVID-19 might have been the most morbid disease we've encountered in a couple of hundred years. It's right up there with the flu and the common cold. If you were near it, you're gonna get it. Now it's become weaker and weaker because we've had several waves of it going through our bodies, our population. But to begin with, it was, I think you would have to say respectable mortality. A significant number of people who got it died. That's the problem because millions are gonna get it. That means thousands are gonna die. And that's a big disruption. Was it as mortal as the plague? No, no, the plague was extremely morbid and extremely mortal. And that's what you're gonna be looking at next week, right? It combined high morbidity and mortality up to 95% of the population in certain towns died. Sometimes they were completely wiped out. Europe as a whole, anywhere from 25 to 40% of the total population in just a few years, right? And again, this cracks the shell of the Middle Ages, the nobles dying at times lessened their control even more. And when the peasants die, when the peasants die, which of course they do by the millions, it disrupts society again. Now there's so few peasants around that they can start to throw their weight around a little bit. You know, the, 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 the knight next door, he gives better terms. He's nicer. I'm going to go over there and work for him. You can't stop me. Or I'm going to go to the city. I'm going to seek my fortune there, work in the trades, maybe become an apprentice. Uh, to one of the guilds. And the church, again, has just no clue how to address this disease. This is where all the hospitals were, but they, they had all these weird ideas about healing that just didn't apply to diseases. The church in the Middle Ages was good at fixing a broken bone, a burn, something like that, but an internal disease, they had no, no clue. There was this idea of miasma, right? that there is this kind of mist that hangs around a dead body and you got to keep away from that, which is actually not totally wrong, right? It is contagious, right? But it's, it can be contagious in so many more ways than just around a dead body, right? And a lot of other superstitions came out. Next week, 
You're going to play Bubo, which is a decidedly plaguey PBL, in the village of uh, Ipping on Thames. These are the different kinds of people. You'll be assigned one of those roles. Here we go. The villains, Beardsley, Zarnecki, Gulick, Joseph, Mason, Masidi, Seski, Mr. Shining. The crafters, people from the local area who can do a thing. You decide, are you a Mason? Are you a Thatcher? Are you a Hooper? Anything you like is fine. Gersky Minor, Thomas and Mull, the merchants who come to town with lots of wealth and stuff to trade, Rice and Riley Major, the priest, of course, I went to the most inspirational person I could find, Mr. Gilbert, the mistral, Mr. Duquette, who is only here to entertain you and to make you happier, and of, I thought of Miss Shotney as the knight who rules the land with an iron fist, no doubt. You'll have certain things. You'll need certain things, right? The rules are coming. When you role play, the table will always move back to the side. When you role play, you will have little stickers. If you're a villain, you'll have green stickers for food, right? If you're a minstrel, you'll have, I think it's blue stickers for happiness, right? And then you go and you make an exchange. And when you exchange, you take the sticker and you put it on the other person, on their clothes, on their back of their hand, wherever, you know, watch out for the hair and stuff. You have to have the sticker on your body. And those stickers will be marked. If you're villain number two, it'll say V2. Right? And you'll go and do your exchange and you'll get what you need. You'll pay your taxes to the night. You'll maybe go to church. If you want to be a little more pious, you could go hunting. You could let your kids play on the commons. All these choices are up to you. And then when that's done, we spin the wheel of woe to see who has been exposed to the plague. And if V2 comes up and you have a V2 sticker on your head, that means you're in trouble too, <laughs> right? So, so you need to think about getting what you need and watching what happens. There'll be a second round of the game, which I suggest will be rather important. <laughs> okay. All right, next week, you'll get the rules starting tomorrow. That was a complete insult to all the subject matter. I want to <laughs> Anybody with homework? Anybody with homework? Mr. City, I got a bunch of it's like keep catching you late. There you go. Thank you. Right. Ms. Zarnicki. Oh, she's the yes, issue. Very much. I had a couple minutes to spare. Yeah. All I have to do is perform a delivery of anybody at the exact same time and they all die. It doesn't, it doesn't, only if you get the plague. So just stay, stay I you get, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the notes, Mr. Uh, Duquette. You can you can sing a little ditty or you can tell them a joke or a riddle. Okay. Right? Okay. And if they if they listen specifically to you, you can exchange the stickers. Okay. Okay, good. So, Medieval jokes, please. How many monks does it take to screw in a light bulb? That kind of thing. 27. Really? Yes. They all stand up. You know, they're like little short guys with bald heads. They stand on top of each other. Like sure, they, they do. Stack up. Wow, you're really on fire. Right. Are, are you in a hurry? I want to, I want to read this. Student director for my Peter's alive. Where's Peter's alive? Um, in whatever churches, then I guess. At it at the moment. Your itinerant plan. Yes, because we got kicked out the last one. Oh, dear. Or little children around because oh. children aren't allowed to run around after a play. They've been stuck on stage the entire time. Yeah, sure. That's Please. very reasonable. We also perform at like uh, That sounds great. We do the best we can. There was a lot of people with but something was put in half that stuff.
Thank you. 